Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Puffing and puffing a little bit, but we made it. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in chapter 14 tonight. Same passage as last week. We only got through part one last week. The message entitled, Bulldogs, Battle, and Bitterness. Bulldogs, Battle, and Bitterness, part two. Now, of course, last week, actually, it was missionary Paul Durand at our missions conference Sunday, so this is going back two Sundays for our review. And the last time we were there in Acts chapter 14, I'm going to be reading a few extra verses tonight just so we recall the setting in which we found ourselves, Paul on his great missionary journey that was going to go out as far as Derby and then come back and visit all of the cities where he had previously visited and in which he had gotten some rather severe and serious opposition. Acts chapter 14, I'll begin in verse 1. It came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude both of Jews and also of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore, there's the bulldog in Paul, he got some opposition, so he decided to stick around. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, so the thought is in their mind already, all the way back there at Iconium, they were aware of it, and they fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and into the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, and you recall that that is not one of the necessities for healing, although it occurred in this place, there were other places, and we saw Peter doing the same type of a miracle, where the man did not have faith to be healed. That is something against the modern faith healer movement. They always say that if there's a failure, the problem is with the person not having enough faith. But uh, God, frequently through the New Testament, have illustrations of healings which there was no faith in the person who was healed at all. He said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lachaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. God takes care even of the pagans who hate him. Isn't that amazing? Common grace. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Albeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up. Here's the bulldog again, and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, 
enter into the kingdom of God. They had seen it happen to Paul. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia and thence sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. End of the text. An exciting passage. The kind of missionary journey that most missionaries hope they never have to go on. But one that God used in an incredible way, as we have seen in the past, to open an entire region to the gospel of Christ with thousands of believers and a region called the region of the thousand churches because so many believers were established in congregations all over that area. They recall when we were looking at the preceding verses in verses 11 through 20, we saw that if you start with the wrong premises, it's certain that you will draw the wrong conclusions, even when you have clear evidence in front of your eyes. And we noted that that's why faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not faith comes by miracles and miracles by some unknown supernatural power. The key issue, and Paul understood that and proclaimed it clearly, the key issue is the word of God so that you can understand what you see with your eyes. When witnessing, as in law, you have to lay a foundation, and we've discussed that in great detail before, so we'll not do that again, but Paul did that. Paul explained to them, he laid the foundation because they were not people who had the foundation of the Old Testament book of Genesis. He laid the foundation with creation. The pagans could see the creation all around them, but they couldn't make sense of it without a biblical explanation. And that's why Paul immediately switched gears and drew his audience back to the doctrine of creation, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard, they rent their clothes and ran among the people, saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We are men of like passions with you, and preach that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea, and all things that are therein. We went over that passage, you recall, in the book of Romans, where creation reveals the true creator God in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 23. And we find that when people reject the testimony of creation, because they know that there's a God, they know that they are without excuse, we know that the creation reveals certain things about the character of God. Paul says so in verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them. God specifically put creation there to stop the mouths of the pagans. And that's why pagans today hate creation so much. Why they attack it so viciously with the doctrine of evolution, which is make-believe fantasy and has no ground in fact. They hate creation because it points them back to the fact that they are responsible to the creator God to whom someday they will give an account. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's the way the book of Romans starts, that great doctrinal epistle. Paul's writing to Gentiles at Rome. And he brings them back to the foundational issue of creation. Paul knows that if you turn aside from the doctrine of creation, it ends in a society that is overwhelmed with sodomy and homosexuality of every sort, male and female, and all kinds of other horrendous sexual perversion, idolatry of animals, and we have that in our various pro-animal pro movements today, and a huge list of sins in verses 28 through 31. Creation is the primary use, means that God uses to hold them accountable 
even when they've not heard the gospel. David says so in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. So when you find people that do not have a foundation, where you have to start if you're going to witness to them effectively, is with the doctrine of creation. The third thing that we learned was people act and react on their wrong premises immediately when they draw the wrong conclusions, and that's what they did here. And Paul explains that theologically in 1 Corinthians 2.14, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. He says the same thing in 2 Corinthians, and we're going to be spending some time in 2 Corinthians tonight, so I think it's very appropriate that this passage is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, ha, and here we're back to creation again. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Where's that? Genesis 1. Has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The fourth lesson that we learned was people will almost always have some twisted truth mixed in with their conclusions so that it seems to be perfectly rational to them. They lifted up their voices saying in the speech of Lacaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. Satan's best lies are the lies that have a ring of truth about them. God did, in fact, come to earth as a man. Jesus Christ was and is the God-man. Colossians 2.9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness, the pleroma, of the Godhead bodily. The undiminished deity in the full, true, sinless humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ is essential to the gospel of salvation according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and Romans chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. Lesson 5 that we learned was people will always assume that the gods that they have created are the correct gods instead of the God who created them when they see some supernatural manifestation of power. Lesson 6 that we learned was pagan priests will always go along with what the people think so that they can keep control of those who are blinded by Satan. Remember, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So those who are the priests of the gods of this world will always try to keep people blinded from the light of the gospel of Christ. Lesson number seven that we learned is blind leaders leading blind people do not like to be embarrassed, and when it happens, they will react violently and encourage the people to react violently. And we saw the incredible timing in that passage where all this is taking place just as the persecutors from Antioch and Iconium arrive on the scene. Nothing happens by accident in the plan of God. It might have been seeming to the Apostle Paul or to others around that, oh man, what bad timing to have those guys show up right at that moment. But God had a purpose in it, and we're going to see some of that purpose tonight. <clears throat> God had a purpose in having those people show up and having the horrible stoning that took place of Paul occur right at that moment. That was a critical key in breaking through the darkness of the gospel spreading to that region. Paul had to have been stoned. You'll find out why in just a few moments. God made sure that those guys made good time from Antioch and Iconium. He made sure that when they arrived, that this was going on right outside the city gates with the priest of Jupiter and all the people who had the wrong presuppositions and then who were instantly persuaded. You think of the crowds at the death of Christ. They had hailed him as the Messiah coming into Jerusalem, riding on an ass, on the colt the fold of an ass, just a week earlier. And then within that week, their hearts are turned around where they're yelling with their leaders, crucify him, crucify him. It's happening here to Paul. There are people that can happen to you too. And so we see that there is this violent reaction that is taking place here. And then the eighth lesson that we learned, and this is really a key verse that we want to look at tonight in considering why the bulldog got no more opposition at Lystra, that verse 19, there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. 
They thought, we've gotten rid of him. He'll never be back. When you're dead, you're dead. Oh, how little they knew of the power of the living God. How little they knew of Jesus Christ, who was not only brutally murdered on Calvary's cross, but came back three days later in power from the dead. Paul says the resurrection was with power in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It stops the mouth of the gainsayers. We looked at all the various practical actions and applicable doctrines listed in that passage. The sinful state of man, the call to repentance, the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of long-suffering before judgment, the doctrine of common grace. And we noted that we should always be quick to point out the doctrines that the scripture says on any occasion whereby the gospel that we're presenting is being challenged. You need to know your Bible. You need to know how to answer the critics. Peter says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Peter also reminds us, as we saw, that the doctrine of creation is central to that when you are persecuted. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. And he ends that passage, he goes on about talking about suffering as a Christian, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing, now listen to the last phrase, as unto a faithful creator. It's all over the New Testament. If you want to be able to present the gospel of Christ to the pagan society around us who has lost the foundation of scripture, it's been removed from all the public schools. It is mocked openly in the classroom. It is removed from all society around us. Our country is trying to confine it to the churches and hopefully they are desirous of destroying it even in the churches, as has been done in all the liberal and apostate churches around us. You've got to start with creation. That brings us to the issue of bitterness where we focused on April 20th. Quick review, bitter people don't give up easily. We saw that that is a very key issue, it's a key quality of the unsaved. As it's written, there's none righteous, no not one, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood. That's what we saw in the passage that we were looking at in Acts. Secondly, bitterness often goes to greater extremes to get revenge than friendship goes to do good. And we saw the illustration of the, the friend who came and asked for bread at night and the guy didn't want to get up and he really didn't want to get up, but finally that persistent friend made him get out of bed and give him some bread to feed that, that visitor that had come by. We saw that the removal of bitterness from your life is the responsibility of every Christian. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you of all malice. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We saw that bitterness will not only defile you, but it will defile and destroy others who are around you. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. And we saw that paralleled with Esau and giving up his birthright. Bitterness can cause you to lose your birthright, not your salvation, but your birthright. The right of the primogenitor, the right of the firstborn, the right that you have to special inheritance. And as compared to fornication, which shows you how seriously God considers it. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing. That's what you're going to lose. If you've got bitterness in your life. He was rejected, for he found no place of repentance. You can't get it back. Though he sought it carefully with tears. We covered 16 very important lessons about bitterness. Bitterness.
Remember, this is bulldogs, battle, and bitterness. So what's going on in our text here tonight? Quickly, those 16 lessons. The twofold preventative of bitterness is the active pursuit of peace and holiness. Number two, bitterness can creep in when we're not paying attention. We must actively and diligently be on the alert for its seeds. Number three, bitterness is the result of not appropriating the grace of God when adversity comes into our lives or when other people do us dirty. In other words, when we take offense instead of forgiving. Dear people, you will go through, as we spoke about this morning, deserts in your life. How you respond to it is a key tipping point issue. If it causes or you allow it to cause bitterness in your heart, you will lose God's blessing. If you blame God and allow rancor and anger against God in your heart, you will lose God's blessing. Bitterness is parallel to the sin of fornication. And we pointed out that there are many people who are goody two-shoes who would never get involved in sex outside of marriage, but they're just as badly polluted with bitterness as the whoremonger or the prostitute. Bitterness is a parallel sin to being profane, treating holy things as though they were common. That's how Esau treated his birthright with disdain and figured he would never be held to his promise to trade a bowl of bean soup for the birthright, and he was wrong. Bitterness is one of the sins that leads to the point of no return. And yes, there are points of no return. Certain sins in the life of the believer, even when forgiven, have lasting results in time and space that cannot be reversed. Bitterness can be repented of, but it can never restore the damage that was done. Bitterness starts as seeds and proceeds to roots. It does not have to fully flower into a plant before it defiles you and everyone around you. Bitterness always defiles more than the person who has the bitter spirit. It ruins marriages. It ruins friendships. It splits churches. It splits church boards. Bitterness always defiles. It's based on selfishness and defending what we perceive to be our rights. And we talked about learning to turn our rights over to Christ because he can defend them if he wants to or use the violation of your rights to help mature you into a more Christ-like person. Bitterness takes and does not give in love, just like fornication. Bitterness builds a wall around you like a fort, but you'll starve to death inside the fort and you become isolated. Bitterness, a bitter spirit is always evident even when you try to hide it, and it always drives people away that you should be trying to reach for Christ. It's definitely not the spirit of Christ that you should be cultivating in your garden. Think of Christ on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Three final ones. Bitterness is guaranteed to destroy the fruit of the spirit in your life. Love, joy, peace, and so on. Bitterness maintains a scorch and burn policy that destroys everything it touches. Bitterness results in revenge rather than in forgiveness. And we saw that that's the reason that bitterness is placed in the same category as fornication and the profane person. Instead, we're commanded to be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Jesus has much more to be bitter about than you will ever have to be bitter against any other person, but Jesus has forgiven you. That brings us to our study for tonight. We find the Apostle Paul being stoned. They drew him out of the city, supposing that he had been dead, down in verse 19. Albeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. On the walls of the wrestling gymnasium at Stony Brook School for Boys, and I don't know if it's still there or not, but back in my days, it was one of the old buildings on campus, and they had all these signs posted on the walls around the wrestling gymnasium. And we would read those every day as we came into the gym. Our coaches drilled it into us. This is something you need to know. As you go out onto the mat and your opponent stands there facing you at whatever weight level category you are in, you better remember what you learned reading those signs. Problem was, of course, the opponents could also read the signs when they came to our gymnasium, but they didn't have quite as long to, to meditate on those sayings as we had to meditate on them. And one of those signs read, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight 
in the dog. I remember that one so well. And I think the Apostle Paul gives us a clear illustration about what a bulldog is like. Paul didn't quit after he was knocked down, beat up and covered with rocks. Paul went back and jumped into the ring like nothing had happened. Did you notice as we read through the text tonight, nobody opposed him after he went back into town after the stoning. He got up and went back into that city. He didn't get up and sneak away to another town. He came back into town, no doubt a pretty bloody sight to see. He checked into the local motel. He freshened up, stayed overnight, and it says he headed out of town the next morning. Now, tolerate me for just a little bit with some sanctified imagination, if you will. I suspect that word got around that Paul was back in town. I suspect that the priest of Jupiter knew it. After all, the temple was right at the gate where Paul was dragged out and where Paul came marching back into the city. I suspect that the priest started to sweat and perhaps he got the willies when Paul walked by and maybe even gave him a shout, hey, did you take notes on my sermon today? <laughs> Pretty important stuff, I hope you believe it. I suspect that the rock throwers saw him coming. They may have peeked out their windows and out their doors and then closed shop early and hung up a sign, out to lunch. The street got empty as Paul led the little band of disciples back into town, smiling and waving and singing gospel choruses and passing out tracts. Now you know that's imagination. But you know the thing is the effect didn't wear off either. After getting some shut-eye that night, perhaps even holding an evening Bible study first, because there were some converts, Paul left the next morning to do some more open-air evangelism in Derby. But he wasn't about to give up on Lystra. After he preached in Derby, he came back to Lystra. We find that he spent quite a bit of quality time in Derby. The text says he departed with Barnabas to Derby, and when they preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. He clearly spent some time in Derby. The persecutors would have heard about that. The opposition had plenty of time to regroup and bring the persecutors back from Antioch and Iconium. But there was not a peep out of the priest of Jupiter. There was not a peep out of the people who had stoned him a few days earlier. There was not a peep out of the persecutors who tracked him from Iconium to Antioch, even though he's traveled straight back to those cities as well after he had made his I dare you trip back to Lystra. Let me tell you a story. The story is told of a family that bought a big young Irish setter and put him in their backyard to guard their home. That big old dog soon got to thinking that this was a pretty nice place and considered it his personal territory. And if you've ever had a dog, you know that's how they are. A few days later, a little short bulldog came waddling down the alley, came to the fence at the back of the yard where the Irish setter lived and squeezed under the fence to meet the new dog. He was only about half the size of the setter. The setter looked down his nose and disdained at this runny little dog with the flat face and the bow-legged body. The yard belonged to the setter, and the setter would set that matter straight with the stranger right away. With a loud, low growl, the setter charged the little dog. A furious fight followed, and after blood and fur went flying in every direction, the setter, by mere size and weight, managed to push the little bulldog back under the fence. The setter licked his wounds in satisfaction that he had clearly established his territory and he could enjoy the yard to himself in peace. The next day, here came the little bulldog again. The setter eyed him warily, expecting him to waddle on by down the alley and out of sight, but no. The little bulldog squeezed himself back under the fence. Again, the setter rushed the runt, and another furious fight ensued. And again, after much labor, the setter managed by sheer size and weight to shove the little dog back under the fence. The next day, 
Oh, no. Here came the little bulldog again. <laughs> Once again, he shoved himself under the fence. This time, the setter trembled and ran to the far side of the yard where the doghouse was located and jumped up on the roof. The little dog waddled over to the doghouse, but he was too short to jump up on the roof where the shedder was, uh, setter was shaking. The bulldog sniffed around the yard for a few minutes, squeezed back under the fence, and disappeared down the alley. He would never again have to worry about establishing who really was the master of that particular yard. <laughs> it's apocryphal, I know, but it teaches us a point. Paul had been in some serious physical confrontations. He had gotten beaten up pretty badly on many occasions. He makes mention of that fact that it happened more than once. He tells us about the scars that he received in Galatians chapter 6, verse 17. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. That's a very interesting passage if you've ever had any time to study it in any kind of a detail. That phrase, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The word that's translated marks in Galatians 6.17 is the Greek word stigmata. This is the word from which we get our English word stigma. In our modern way of thinking, a stigma is something that makes other people shun you in a bad sense, a sign of opprobrium. Historically, at the time of the writing of the New Testament, it was used as speaking of a branding scar left by a hot iron or a tattoo emblazoned on a slave to show who owned him. That was a stigmata. It was a scar burned into the flesh or tattooed in the flesh to show ownership. Thus it later came to mean a mark or a stain of shame and discredit. In Paul's case, these were the scars from the wounds that Paul received in the service of his master. Roman Catholic theologians have taken this stigmata to mean that Paul could manifest the visible wounds that Christ received on the cross. The bleeding head, the holes in the hands and feet, the gaping wound in the side. Throughout Roman Catholic history, there have been notable Catholic mystics who could go into a religious trance or into religious ecstasy in which they could suddenly manifest these marks received by Christ on the cross. This is definitely not what Paul was talking about because Paul was definitely not a Roman Catholic mystic. In fact, Paul talks about these scars that he had in his body on many other times that he as a little bulldog received when he was being beaten up. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 21. I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. Paul couldn't even count the number of times that he had been beaten. Now, folks, I think most of us are not bulldogs. I think if we had to go and count the number of times we had been beaten, we could probably count it on one hand, and we could tell you the number of scars that we had as a result of that. Paul didn't even know how many scars he had. Hard to count scars on your back, you know. In stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. That's 195 whiplashes. Just by being beaten, the Jews would not allow you to be beaten more than 40 times, so they always stopped at 39 just to make sure they didn't, quote, break the law. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. That's what occurred at Lystra. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. You know, we have one shipwreck recorded. We don't even have the other two shipwrecks recorded for us in the book of Acts. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And that was not on the occasion 
that shipwreck where Paul was cast on Melita. It was on some other occasion where he floated in the Mediterranean for a night and a day, hanging on to some piece of wreckage. Would you keep on going if this happened to you? In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. The perils of Paul, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Hey, says Paul, that's only external. That's not a big deal. For most of us, we would consider that a rather big deal. Listen to his next statement, verse 28. Beside those things that are without. All that stuff is external. Beside those things that are without. Here's what was really painful for Paul. That which cometh upon me daily. Now those things just happened on occasion. Didn't happen every day. It happened enough times where you and I would probably have backed out of the mission. But Paul had something that happened to him every day. They said, that's where the real weight is. That's where the real pain is. That's where the real difficulty is. That's where the real opposition is. That which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Ah, oh, dear people, how infrequently do churches understand the burden of the ministry. That which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed for evermore, knoweth that I lie not. Paul said, I'm not making this up. Let me tell you about the stuff that happened to me in case you haven't heard. I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. And through a basket, uh, through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. I think you'll understand why I like to call this the bulldog chapter. Paul was one tough little bulldog. He would not take no for an answer from any opponent, any persecutor, or any opposition. And notice well, verse 25, we read it just a moment ago. Verse 25 makes direct reference to his stoning at Lystra, which is in our text tonight. 1 Corinthians 11:25. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once was I stoned. We know that's this occasion. It's the only time it happened to him. Thrice I suffered shipwreck a night and a day have I been in the deep. He was beaten three times with rods. We have no record of those beatings or the five times the Jews beat him with whips. But we know for sure when and where he got stoned. It was at Lystra, the passage that we're studying. Notice what immediately follows also in 2 Corinthians 12. Now that was uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now we get to chapter 12. On no other occasion in the book of Acts does it appear that Paul was dead. And so Paul perhaps makes reference to his experience at Lystra in 2 Corinthians 12. The very thing that follows his description in 2 Corinthians 12 verses 1 through 9. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Very key. Remember that 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Ah, he lets us know who got the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, 
the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. It was not something Paul enjoyed. And he said unto me, and how often we quote this verse out of its context, for the petty little things that happen in our lives, think of it in the context of what we've just read about Paul. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, as we read that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is very careful to give great deference to Christ and not to take glory for himself. But you know, there is no record anywhere else in the New Testament unless we consider the book of Revelation, which was written many years later, where a man is taken and sees heavenly things and then is returned. Unless it's the experience of Paul at Lystra. There is no break in the Greek text between chapter 11 where he mentions the Lystra stoning and chapter 12. Another point of interest, the timing of the writing of 2 Corinthians would fit the general time frame in relation to the Lystra missionary journey. 2 Corinthians was written about 14 years after that journey and that's the timeline that Paul gives us as he writes to the Corinthians. Second Corinthians is also what has been called a circular letter. That is a letter that was sent to many other churches, just like Galatians, which was written about the same time. And you know, as we read just a moment ago, Galatians is the other book where we saw Paul making mention of his scars received in the service of Christ. I think that's pointing a certain direction. As far as I can find out, there do not appear to be any other instances recorded in Acts or elsewhere that would fit that time frame where Paul would have needed to come across, quote, such an one who was caught up to the third heaven, that's the presence of God. First heaven is the atmosphere. Second heaven is what we call outer space. The third heaven is the presence of God. But I think that verse 7, which I drew to your attention just a moment ago, Verse 7 clinches the matter that Paul is not speaking about some other person. Here's what verse 7 says again. Unless I should be exalted above measure, ah, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You know, it's interesting, as Paul writes there, it gives us an insight into what he understood his own personal sin to be, the sin of pride. Paul had been a very righteous, or we should say self-righteous, young man. Zealous for the law, he calls himself that. A young man who thought that he was keeping the law when they stoned Stephen. A young man who had been raised under the feet of one of the greatest legal minds of the time, Gamaliel. Paul says, God knows what my heart problem is. It's the issue of pride. And so, because he gave me these revelations to make sure that I didn't get puffed up about it. He gave me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Interesting, later in his epistles, Paul talks about Satan being used as an instrument of chastening. It can be even to the point of death, as James tells us. God sometimes allows certain oppression or attacks on a believer to remind the believer that his strength is not in himself, his strength is in God. And the moment he lets down his shield of faith, the moment he takes off any part of his armor, he's going to find a fiery attack from the devil. Sometimes the trial is not taken away. 
And in fact, it is used as a point of torment by Satan, according to that verse 7, to keep us from pride. But it's also clear from the passage and elsewhere that God promises sufficient grace to bear the trial if we will take the grace of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 gives us that promise. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted of that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. I know it's only speculation, but perhaps Paul saw some of the same things that John saw in the book of Revelation. But Paul was told not to write them down, in contrast to John, who was specifically told in the opening verses of Revelation, write the things which you've seen. Perhaps Paul saw other things that neither he nor John were permitted to write. You remember that John was specifically told not to write what the seven thunders uttered, although John had heard it. Perhaps the things Paul saw were things that were so exciting and so motivating that this revelation was what confirmed him, or in him, the character of the bulldog. We don't know for sure. Perhaps we'll never know. But we do know that... As Paul writes again to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2.9, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Paul had a glimpse of some of those things in heaven. How exciting that must have been. How much he must have desired to say, Lord, I want to stay. And God said, no, you're going back. But then Paul could honestly add, if that were his situation, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The very next verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Well, that's our time for tonight. Lord willing, we'll pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word. It's exciting. It's it's very interesting to see how throughout history things have been taken and twisted by Satan to pervert the message of Christ, the focus on the Catholic mystics, the focus on the stigmata, the focus on all the weird things that are out there, instead of realizing that Paul loved the Lord Jesus Christ so much that he was willing to give his life for it no matter how many times he was beaten, no matter how many, how many times he was whipped, no matter the fact that he was stoned, no matter the fact that he suffered shipwrecks, no matter the fact that he suffered persecution from false brethren and from pagans, and persecution in the cities and persecution in the wilderness and, and trouble everywhere he went. But he stuck with it. He stuck with it. He stuck with it. He would not back down. He knew that his life was in your hands. You could take it when you wanted. He looked forward to that, to be absent from the body, is present with the Lord. He says, I'd rather be absent and be with Christ, but to stay around is more needful for you. And then at one point, he knew it was time to go. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me at that day, and not unto me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Time is coming for each one of us. For some, perhaps sooner than others. We have only a limited amount of time still to serve Christ. We have only a limited amount of time to still proclaim the gospel. Only a limited amount of time to be a bulldog. Only a limited amount of time to keep coming back and refusing to take no for an answer. Insisting that the truth of the gospel must be heard. Father, make us men and women of Christ who never give up. Who never give up. Who never give up. But who keep pressing forward in the fight that moves us into eternity. Thank you again, Father, for your word. We pray for your blessings upon it tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 